Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Gilson, and I'm the Executive Director with United Way Oxford. Welcome to our first uh, Community United Conversation webinar series um, for 2024. And tonight's topic is the truth about alcohol. It's sobering. And I promise you, you're going to learn a lot about uh, some of the new things that have come forward on on um, th through Canada Health and, and some of the recommendations about alcohol, safe alcohol intake and what that might look like. Um, so this is really going to be an interesting session for us. I am thrilled to have our guests and uh, to have a, a great presentation as well. As we get started, I would like to just quickly um, speak uh, about a land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm sitting at our in our United Way office in downtown Woodstock. And I would like to begin the meeting by acknowledging that we are on Indigenous land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, uh, as we gather here, there have been Indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of this place. We acknowledge that the land is the territorial, is the traditional territory of the Anashpik, Lanaipe, Adirondack, and Haudenosaunee. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic and current connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made and are making both in shaping and in strengthening this community and in particular our province and our country as a whole. As settlers, we, the, this recognition of the current contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities. Uh, and in particular, to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across our country and in memory of the deceased children and survivors of the Indian residential schools. Um, so again, I'm speaking from the from downtown Woodstock, and I hope if you could just take a moment to reflect on the land that you are on this evening um, as we begin this journey together. So very quickly, I will just give a, a, a bit of an overview about United Way Oxford. And so United Way Oxford is, you know, we talk about we are 100% local. We are an organization that um, works here in Oxford County. The dollars we raise support individuals here in our community. We work with partners across our county. Our work is really about knowing our community, knowing where the gaps and the services are, and our opportunities to help address those. That might be by making investments, that might be by leveraging relationships and opportunities, connections, providing resources and research. Um, we, are, we are an organization, uh, we like to think of ourselves as small but mighty, um, that do a lot to work with our partners to, to make Oxford a better place, a healthier place for all. Um, and for those of you that may not be really familiar with United Way, we really look at our community. We have three different pillars, moving people from poverty to possibility, building strong communities with healthy people, and making sure that children and families can be all that they can be so that they can grow and prosper um, and thrive, uh, certainly uh, children into adulthood. And so we, we have many investments in many different areas. Um, and I think that that's important. But this evening, this is really this webinar series that we have been doing for the last number of years is really about building awareness and community capacity. Um, so whether that's with volunteers or community members, we really one of our roles is to bring people together to learn, to reduce stigma, um, to to educate, to make people aware of of situations. And, and we use this series, we say that we shine a light on unignorable issues. And we've had such a vast variety of topics over the last number of years. And the every one of these sessions are recorded. They're available on our website. Um, you can go there and go to the link. And you can, you know, they're great for whether it's a book club or a workplace lunch and learn 
Um, there's all kinds of opportunities. Um, hopefully you can find these as a reference tool. Um, and we're also very fortunate that we have um, Roger's Cable who uh, show the, the recordings on our behalf. So tonight I would like to give a little shout out to Southwest Public Health. They are our sponsor for this evening. And we are very grateful for their assistance, not just in sponsorship, but in their support of making this evening happen. Um, and let me just very quickly go through a few rules. We will do our darndest to answer any questions that people have. So through the, um, through the evening, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat box and we will, um, we will really try to be able to do that. We will also share resources and, um, you know, it might be uh, PDFs or uh, links to, to different websites, et cetera. So we'll do our best to share resources as we go along. Um, and let me see what, let me see what else. Um, I will also point out though, if there's anything in this conversation that is at all triggering to you or causes any kind of anxiety whatsoever, please um, consider reaching out to reach out. Um, and their number is 1-866-933-2023. Um, and they would be a great um, place to connect with if indeed you need some assistance. And so with that, I would now like to perhaps um, move to our panelists. And so we're going, I'm going to introduce or have our, our panelists actually introduce themselves. They can do it much better than I can, but they will introduce themselves and then we will have a presentation followed by our traditional panel discussion for those of you that have been following us along for the last number of years. So let me start, if I may, with Jacqueline. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about who you are, where you work and what your role is there? Sure. So I'm a public health nurse. My name is Jacqueline and I work at Southwestern Public Health here in Woodstock and uh, we cover a large area. So not just Oxford County, but we also cover St. Thomas and Elgin area as well. So we cover a larger region and um, my work is mostly around increasing awareness around the harms of alcohol. So on the one hand and on the other hand, um, increasing the ability of people to follow through with guidance. So that would be through environmental controls around policy and that kind of thing. So it's really setting people up for success with the guidance that we provide them. So I often will work around alcohol policy and then also awareness around alcohol harms. Excellent. Thank you. So well positioned for tonight. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and Melanie, may I ask you to do the same? Absolutely. My name is Melanie Rodriguez. I am a registered psychotherapist, which means that I support people in their mental health and wellness. And sometimes that means making changes in the way that they do things or the way that they think about things and supporting people in feeling better and living in a way that's sometimes a little bit different than they have been. I am a member of an integrated wellness clinic here in Woodstock called Journey Well Health and Wellness, where we have a number of clinicians who focus on those same things, helping people to live healthy lives, to experience wellness in their mental health, their physical health, their psychosocial and spiritual health. And the hope is that in combination with some of these policy pieces, we can be some of the feet on the ground to support people and being really curious about how to live wonderful and healthy lives. And that is really what we want. We want people to be happy, healthy, safe, well here, mm -hmm. not just across Oxford, obviously, but everywhere. So thank you both. And now I'm actually going to turn the screen, if I may, over to Jacqueline. And Jacqueline's going to walk us through a presentation and really speak um, about some of the changing information on the research of around alcohol and the impacts on community, et cetera. And, and I will point out, and we'll come back to this again afterwards, that you know, often, especially for, for some of our webinar series, people will think about issues that have very severe societal consequences that are really extremely challenging, um, can be quite difficult social conversations. And tonight we are not going to be talking uh, specifically about 
really problematic uh, drinking or alcohol consumption. We know, unfortunately, that there are many people who struggle um, with that kind of addiction and the consequences. So we know that that is a very important topic. But tonight's topic is really a little more broadly based. Um, and I think it's meant to really connect to each and every one of us in our own way. And so Jacqueline, if, uh, if you'd like to take it away. Thanks so much for joining us today. And um, as I introduced myself earlier, I'm Jacqueline, I'm a public health nurse from Southwestern Public Health. And in my role as a public health nurse, my main interest is to help my support my community be as healthy as can be. And before we begin, I want you to consider to yourself how you feel about alcohol, wine, liquor, beer, coolers, what words come to mind and what feelings do you get? So I'm gonna start this presentation off with a short compilation about alcohol. The audio is from a TED talk from Michaela Weaver, an acclaimed author and woman's alcohol coach from the UK. So let's have a listen and I'm hoping that my audio will work. Let me ask you a question. If you were being conned, would you want to know about it? Me too. But the truth is, that I was conned for nearly all of my adult life, in fact, my life, up until 2016, that is. I was conned by the most clever and insidious con artist, possibly of our time. And that con artist, alcohol. You see, I didn't know back then that alcohol is the second most addictive drug on planet Earth. Second only to heroin. And it's not just harmful because it causes us seven different types of cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, cardiac disease, and of course liver disease that we know about. It's harmful because it affects our behavior. Alcohol has been wrecking relationships and families for thousands of years. But why is alcohol and the media and the advertising industry a con? Because a con artist is very, very clever. A con artist gets our trust slowly, surely, by stealth, until we believe in them 100, undoubting percent. So we know how you feel about alcohol and the harm. So as stated from the previous video, alcohol causes many harms. It is a risk factor for over 200, 200 health conditions, along with secondary effects such as family conflict, stress, employment issues, legal issues, and the list really goes on. Furthermore, these harms are more often experienced by those um, of vulnerable populations or disadvantaged populations who have a higher rates of hospitalizations and deaths due to alcohol, despite drinking less. Um, alcohol circulates through a person's bloodstream to the whole body, which means it can affect the whole body. And as this uh, picture on the screen uh, shows that there's a lot of different systems that that can, can, can go to throughout. In addition, alcohol is a known carcinogen, so it's known to cause cancer. And we've known this since 1988. Alcohol causes at least seven types of cancer, including the colon, rectum, breast, liver, oral cavity, throat, and neck. Unfortunately, only 25 to 35% of Canadians actually know this fact. Um, part of that lack of knowledge may come from the fact that alcohol is one of the few products that does not have mandatory health warnings. Drinking less is the third leading modifiable risk factor for cancer, meaning that it's one of those things that you can actually do to decrease your chance of getting cancer. What do some of these harms look like at the local level? This chart shows a breakdown of the local deaths, hospitalizations, and ER visits due to alcohol in an average year for the areas of Oxford, Elgin, and St. Thomas, uh, all of these areas combined. The chart shows a breakdown of the different types of harms. As you can see, the main problems caused by alcohol are cancer, cardiovascular disease, and unintentional injuries, and neuropsychiatric visits. I'd also like to point out that alcohol actually causes 76 deaths in our region in an average year. In addition to the health and social costs of alcohol, there are financial costs as well. 
For the past decade, alcohol has cost the province money. In 2020, alcohol cost taxpayers $7.1 billion, while it only produced $5.2 billion in returns. So despite the common myth that alcohol makes money, it actually creates a deficit for the province of about $2 billion annually. While awareness of the harms are needed um, to help people make informed choices, we also need strong policy to support them, to set people up for success. To decrease harms from alcohol, the World Health Organization states that we need to increase prices, decrease availability, and put some restrictions on marketing. There has been a concerning shift in a provincial policy recently, which will allow for an increase in the number of locations you can buy alcohol. So that's increasing availability and then thereby the harms. One interesting policy being considered in the Senate right now is S254, which asks for warning labels on alcohol. We know more about what is in a can of peas than we do in a bottle of alcohol. I would like to leave you with something to consider. Industry tactics harmful to public health are documented, or harmful, yeah, to public health are documented. One being that they have been found to confuse the public about the harms of alcohol, just like tobacco did. One Canadian example of alcohol industry influence recently happened in 2018, where a Health Canada funded study in the Yukon was altered due to the industry influence and threats of legal action. Despite industry claims having no legal merit, the study was altered because the Yukon government did not have the funds to fight legal battles with the Canadian alcohol industry. The industry successfully interrupted labels being put on alcohol bottles that warned the public that, that alcohol causes cancer. I have some questions for you to think out as we go along. One being, how many people locally drink above a moderate risk? This is a tricky one because I haven't told you yet what a moderate risk means. So when I say local, it's the um, Oxford, Elgin, and St. Thomas area. So I'll just kind of give you a moment to kind of think to yourself what you think the rate might be of moderate risk, above moderate risk. So if you thought 39%, you were right. 39% report moderate to risky alcohol use within our region. However, people often underreport how much they drink by 50 to 75%. So it is likely that there is more people drinking above that moderate risk level than is reported. So what does it mean to drink moderately? I'm going to give you a moment to think. How many drinks per week is considered moderate drinking? Three to six, seven to 10, 10 to 15, or 15 to 20? So moderate risk drinking is now considered to be three to six drinks per week. So the yellow area on the chart. In January of 2023, Canada's guidance on alcohol and health was released, which is where I got this chart from. The main message of the guidance is that any and all reductions in alcohol use are beneficial to health. This chart is meant for reflection to help people make choices based on their own risk tolerance, and it does not tell you how much to drink. Looking at what this chart means, one to two drinks is based on a one in a thousand chance of premature death. So that's 17.5 years of life lost. Three to six drinks per week has a risk of one in a hundred of premature death. After six drinks per week, the risk of premature death is even greater and continues to rise with every drink. Sometimes risk is a bit difficult to apply to life. So I have an image that may help. So imagine that you have a bag of gumballs. In that bag, you have red gumballs, which represents illness and early death from alcohol, and the rest are green gumballs, so no increased risk. With every drink you have, you reach your hand into the bag of gumballs to take some out. And the more times you reach into the bag, the higher the risk that you're going to grab red gumballs, so illness, in addition to green. So the main message here is that the more you drink, the higher the risk you will develop health problems due to alcohol. Alcohol comes in different sizes, in percentages and volumes, which makes it hard and complicated to know how much you have actually taken in. If you have, had, if you have a wine glass full of vodka or a wine glass full of wine, it would have very different amounts of alcohol in it. In Canada, a standard drink is 13.45 grams of alcohol, pure alcohol, which brings me to my next question. 
What is a standard drink of wine? Is it four ounces, five ounces, six ounces, or nine ounces? I'll let you think about that for a moment. So a standard drink of wine is five ounces or 142 milliliters. The, more, the majority of people do not know this information. Having standard drink information on alcohol containers would make it easier for people to count the number of drinks they have had. When I first learned about the guidance, I went home and actually measured out with a measuring cup how much my wine glass held at home, so I know what a standard drink looked like for me. Food for thought. Most restaurants serve wine in an amount above the standard drink, so six ounces or nine ounces. Many cocktails have two to three shots in them, and a tall boy of beer of 5% strength is actually around one and a half standard drinks. When people count the number of drinks they have, they need to remember what a standard drink is to be able to accurately assess how much they are drinking. Whether you drink wine, beer, or spirits, it is all equally harmful. There is no such thing as a healthier or less harmful alcohol. Sometimes people think that because they have certain characteristics, this may shield them from harm. But the reality is that alcohol is damaging despite someone's age, sex, gender, ethnicity, tolerance for alcohol, or lifestyle. One piece of information that stands out for many people is that drinking more than two standard drinks per occasion has been shown to increase the risk of injuries and violence for not only the person drinking, but those around them. Further advice that the guidance provides is that if you are planning to become pregnant or are pregnant, there is no safe level of alcohol. If you are breastfeeding, no alcohol is safest. The reason for this is that individuals exposed to alcohol in utero may develop what is known as fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, so or otherwise known as FASD. It is a diagnostic term used to describe effects on the brain and body of people exposed to alcohol during pregnancy. FASD is a lifelong disability, and people with FASD will experience some degree of challenges in their daily living and may need support with motor skills, physical health, learning, memory, social skills, attention, communication, and emotional regulation. In saying that, I would not want a pregnant woman to feel ashamed. And if she found this advice difficult to follow, I would want her to reach out to her healthcare provider to find support. There are many reasons why a woman might continue drinking, which is much more complicated and complex than just knowing you shouldn't. So we went over some of the harms due to alcohol, and I'd also like to share the benefits of reducing, since most people don't know them as well. Uh, reduced alcohol or cutting it out completely can lead to improved sleep quality, more energy, improved concentration, decreased blood sugar, decreased blood pressure, and improved quality of relationships. For some people, reducing their alcohol use will be no problem. For others, this may be more challenging. There will also be people who hear this information and they won't want to make any changes at all, and that's all okay. For those who do want to make changes, a good place to start is by counting how many standard drinks you have per week. Knowing how much you're drinking will help you decide whether you're okay with the amount of risk that it brings. Then you can set a limit or goal for each week. In the past, I've used a standard drink calculator that helps me understand how much is in drinks, such as tall boys and that kind of thing. So you can kind of see at the bottom of the, the slide, there's a, a calculator there. When you're trying to drink less, it is also important to reflect on the reasons you drink. This will provide some clarity on the things that will be easier or harder to, to follow through with your goals. For those who want to reduce or take a break completely, there are many ways to do this, and I have some listed here on the slide. Dry January and dry February are opportunities to explore your drinking habits. Trying mocktails is fun, and it's actually really helpful to those who feel like they might be missing out. Practicing ways to say no thanks. The pressure to drink from others is real and having a way out is, is nice to have. Um, being prepared by looking at a menu, going to someone's house, then bring some of your own drinks. Um, trying to cut down a family member or friend is also very helpful. So, and I know we'll get into that a little bit more later. For those who do not want to reduce, there are always ways to decrease the harms from drinking as well. So setting limits and counting the number of standard drinks you have eating before and while you're drinking, drinking slowly, drinking lots of water, and trying to have an alcoholic, a non-alcoholic beverage in between having alcoholic beverages. Choosing alcohol-free or low alcohol beverage is, is great too. 
try alcohol-free weeks or alcohol-free activities as well. If you're unsure about where to start with reducing the amount you drink, or even if you want to, there is a booklet that may help you called Knowing Your Limits with Alcohol. It is available in hard copy and online. For those who are finding it difficult to reduce drinking or can't stick to the limits you've set for yourself, I would encourage you to call Reach Out, which is a free 24-7 support line for those living in Elgin, Middlesex, and Oxford in London. If there's anything I can leave, with, leave you with today, it is with these messages. That research shows even small amounts of alcohol is harmful, to be mindful of how often and how much you drink, and to consider drinking less and that we need strong policies around alcohol to keep our families and communities safe. And that's it for my presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, before we get to our panel questions, I, I do want to remind people that our intent for this evening is, is to really share information, to bring awareness. Um, we are not here to to fear monger or to create stress for people additional stress in your life um we're certainly not here to judge um in or to uh to in, definitely say there's one thing then you must be doing it it is really about giving information making people aware helping to provide some tools and tips and tricks if that is helpful for you um and really to encourage people to reflect um and and because I think at the end of the day, the the guidelines have changed really quite dramatically over the years. Um, you know, there are many of us who um, certainly have for many years thought that, uh, you know, a glass of wine a day is absolutely, especially if it's red, my personal faith, um, it's good for your heart and it, it is good for you. Um, and, and, you know, just I'll put myself out there right now. Um, I was uh, telling the women I, when I left the office last night, it was late and I was tired. And on my little tiny drive home, I thought, oh, I can't wait to pour a glass of wine and just put my feet up and relax for a few minutes. So far be it from me to throw stones. But we do want to really just, you know, have the conversation and talk about some of the things that maybe we don't know and um, and just give people what they need to do their own reflections. And so now we'll get to the question part of the evening and i'm going to ask um our the first question i think is really that it's timely because we are just about to the end of february and a, a number of years ago we started um with a, a dry january that was really that was became quite popular and i think this might be my first or second time hearing of dry february and so now we have these two dry months um, back to back and certainly lots of people participate. And so ladies, let me ask, when you think about this new trend, it's a little bit of a, it's a promo or an event. Um, it, it is, well, A, we know based on what you've just said, Jacqueline, it certainly is good for us, but how do you think it's impacting society or just people in our community to have this as something to encourage them? I would love to jump in on this one. So one of the things we talk about oftentimes in therapy is how to support people in making change. And one of the ways that people find is helpful to make change is with social accountability, which means that if you have friends or family members who know that you have a goal that you're working on or working towards, whether that be making changes in drinking, for some people it could be weight loss, career goals, to read more books, to buy more sustainable clothing, whatever it is, to share that with your friends and your family makes you more likely to actually follow through with that goal and make lasting change. So when we normalize making goals, like drinking a little bit less or making different, making some changes in the amount that we drink and share that with the world, that supports not only the individual who's making the change to their drinking, but it also creates a little bit of a ripple effect outwards where their friends and their family start to think, that doesn't look so bad. That actually sounds kind of like wholesome or healthy. It feels like new year, new me, maybe I could get on board with that. And that's what we love because that's how we start a movement. It's where change in the individual balloons out into change in society, which is great. 
Excellent. Jacqueline, do you have anything you'd like to add? I agree. And I think it's just an awesome opportunity to be able to really reflect on how alcohol plays a role in your life and the role of your friends and family. And I think it, you don't really understand how it really is part of your life until you you don't use it anymore. And then that's where you recognize the challenges. That's where you recognize where you might miss it. And I think it's just a great opportunity to reflect on um, how much you're drinking and if you really need it in certain circumstances or if in certain circumstances you can give that one up um, or and you don't really need it to have fun or need it to relax or um, need it to even connect with other people. There's like you can do all those things without it as well and still have a great time. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, and that that's a lovely segue to the next question, because um, one of the goals of this session, uh, again, is to share information and raise awareness. Um, but it's also to encourage people to take to think about their own alcohol consumption um, and, and to, you know, your comment about people who often um, report significantly different their perception of their reality is really quite different than their reality. And um, I would like to think that I am not the only one who is not putting five ounces in a wine glass, um, you know, on a regular basis. So my one may not be a one, right? So just encouraging people to reflect on that. And perhaps we, you could share some tools or some tips on, on how people might want to reflect and process and just think about their own personal behavior. Again, not in a judgy way, just to be aware. So I think it would be a great idea for folks to gather a little bit of information by tracking their alcohol intake. Not only calculating how many standard drinks is in this drink that I'm drinking right now, but you could start an Excel sheet or there are apps for that where you can keep track of how many standard drinks you have been drinking. People might be interested to see how that adds up over the space of a month. People might also be interested in tracking that in a budget tracker as well and being really curious about on a month to month basis, consuming alcohol at social events, either at restaurants or in the home, how much is that costing me? And is there a possibility that maybe I'd like to spend that money a different way in my life? Perhaps there is something really wonderful that I could do with that money and I don't feel super duper awesome about spending it on alcohol. Or at the very least, knowing a little bit more about what's happening there can help you to budget for it and help you to understand where exactly your money is going. Good point. I would agree. And then uh, with those trackers, even just knowing when you're having those drinks um, and what you're doing when you're having those drinks provides a lot of information to yourself. So um, you might not want to give up drinking and that's completely okay. That's your choice. You're right. But if you did want to decrease because you're like, you know, the guidance says reducing by any amount is beneficial to your health. So no matter how much you drink, reducing by a little bit will still help you. So if you want to reduce by one or two, or you just start to recognize, you, you start thinking, you know, I didn't really need to drink at that point. Why did I go and open a beer? Like, I actually didn't need that one. That's when you can give up. Whereas if just like you had mentioned that that wine you wanted last night, maybe that's the one you take. Maybe that's the one you drink for however, whatever goal it is you're trying to drink at for that week. So it's kind of a give and take. And it's just learning about um, in the end, what risk are you okay with? And um, recognizing the the ones you really want and the ones you just really didn't need or didn't want or, you know. Absolutely, and which is really why this is like meant to be a really fluid kind of conversation because there is, you know, we're, we're not saying everyone needs to stop and everyone needs to cut back. We're just saying you should be aware and think about what is your comfort level and what you want to do. Um, and so, you know, that, that makes me think about that there are lots of people who, who may want to consider giving up or mostly giving up in, in some ways for their life, but there will be lots of others who actually aren't, aren't in at all prepared to say, I want to give up drinking. I, I want to give up my, my favorite beer on occasion or my favorite glass of wine or whatever, or, uh, 
cooler on a hot summer day, whatever that is. Um, but what about for those who want to reduce, perhaps? And so they, they still, you know, want to enjoy and enjoy at times. Um, but so what are some of the tips and tricks about, you know, how to how to reduce the amount? And, you know, from, um, you know, reducing shot levels to, you know, I think, Jacqueline, your, your, one of your last slides had some tips about, um, you know, having a glass of water for every drink, enjoy a glass of water or some food. Like what are some things for just, just reducing the amount that would help? I love the idea of only buying what you intend on consuming at any given event and bringing your own alcohol and only drinking your own alcohol. Um, so if, for example, your intention is I'm going camping for the weekend and you're planning your menu, if you intend on having six drinks, just grab a six pack as opposed to a two four. I think that sometimes it's easy to go overboard, especially once you start drinking, if you have a liquor cabinet in your home that is full of really beautiful, enticing choices that makes it really available. And the thing about drinking is sometimes once we start, what the alcohol does to us is it impairs our judgment. This is why you're not supposed to drink while you're driving. So if you've already started drinking and then you're making the decisions about how much you want to drink that night and if you want to keep on drinking, you might not necessarily have your full head on your shoulders in that moment. But if you only went out for that one six pack, you've only got that six pack to consume. And so you're limited in that sense. I also really love the idea on one of your slides, Jacqueline, about drinking one non-alcoholic drink for every alcoholic beverage you have, because physically your stomach can only handle so much, right? If you are pounding back a drink and water and a drink and water, um, you're gonna be in the washroom far more often than you're actually up at the bar, and it is gonna cause you to slow down. And this is especially helpful for people who find that having a drink in their hand is a little bit of a behavioral or social lubricant. Sometimes people notice that whenever there's a pause in the conversation, that they take a sip, that it becomes a little bit of a muscle memory. And it can be easy to be flying through cans or bottles much faster than you intended on just because you're talking and sipping and engaging in that muscle memory piece. So if you're looking to sip on something that is bubbly and tastes good while you're chatting with your friends, you can go to Costco, grab a case of bubbly, which is that nice tasty water, and you still get to engage in that routine that you have in those social engagements and you're getting some good water into your system throughout the course of that event. Uh, the hope being that you're not going to wake up with a sore tummy or a headache or a body that feels yicky the next day. Good point. I would agree. It would definitely help with those hangover symptoms. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it definitely slows you down. And uh, I've also heard of a tip where um, you like a wine spritzer, if you want to just water down your wine. So you're still having a bit of wine, but it's not as strong as it originally was. So you still are getting the wine, but you're not getting the, um, as much as the harmful effects. Mm -hmm. So that's also another tip that I've heard a lot of people use as they water it. Be. That's a great idea, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Now, sometimes people feel that they, um, they may not have what I would almost call like social permission not to drink that it, it would be awkward, um, to go to a dinner party and be the no, no, thank you. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not drinking or, um, you know, that and those kinds of places where they just don't feel like oh, so maybe they, they should still have something. And if they don't want that, and that is fine. How can we make sure that we are not imparting really peer pressure on folks um, and not sort of pushing 
you know, whether it's pushing more food on people or pushing a drink, oh no, no, have one more or, or, or you must finish your plate or whatever that is. Um, mm -hmm. How do we, you know, maybe as hosts of a, an event or a party or having friends over, how do we want to be mindful of that? So when you're hosting an event, prior to the event, you might want to ask yourself, how do I want my guests to feel at this event? And you might notice that if you're uh, flitting around and offering people drinks, beverages, opening bottles of wines, that you want people to feel taken care of. You want people to have fun. You want people to not have any worries. And you don't have to serve them alcohol in order to achieve that effect. So can you have alcohol at your party? Totally, absolutely. But not every person needs to have an alcoholic drink in their hand. And this is for a number of reasons. Maybe some people are pregnant. Maybe some people have struggled with alcohol use. Maybe some people have IBS and they don't want to be on the toilet all morning the next morning. Maybe some people are on Accutane for their acne and it could really hurt their liver if they have a drink. And unfortunately, many of those scenarios are scenarios that are socially sensitive somebody might not want to say at a party hey i don't want to be on the toilet all morning so as Absolutely. a host mm -hmm. if you would like to keep your people comfortable right out the gate if you're the person who's at the door saying hey welcome let me take your coats do you want a beer you just have to switch it up a teeny tiny little bit hey welcome let me take your coat we have beer pop juice and water in the kitchen you can help yourself to whatever you'd like uh, asking people to help themselves means that people can make their own decisions on what they want when they want it how much they want so you're not pouring drinks for other people you're not putting a shot in a drink that is a shot that is the size you're normally comfortable with but maybe not the size that somebody else is comfortable with and making sure that you have options for folks and then not pushing it, not questioning it, not um, ribbing somebody and, and making them feel as though they're less fun for not drinking because this happens so often that folks say to their buddies, oh, wife won't let you have any drinks or oh, no fun or ooh, bun in the oven. And that can make a, for a person feel bad about themselves and pressured into drinking if they hadn't intended on drinking. So your role as a host, I think, is very much to provide options and trust that your guests know themselves best. If they say that they're not drinking, they probably have a pretty good reason. It's not your job to convince them. They're going to have a great time at your party if they're drinking water because they're not there for the booze, I bet. I think they're there for you. That's right. I actually love what you just said, Melanie, because one of the other things I, I think that, again, we're, we're trying to just raise awareness and make people think a little bit more. But one of the things is some people have very deep personal reasons for whatever their choices are in life. Um, and it might be, you know, something as simple, like, I don't feel like that tonight. And that's, that's perfectly okay. Or there could be like, whether it's medical reasons, religious reasons. I, I mean, there's so many, and that's personal information that we should not feel that we should be privy to. That is none of our business. And, and I, I don't think ever people are intentionally trying to put someone, a guest or a friend or a family oh. member you're not trying to put them in a uh, in a difficult position or an awkward position. Um, I think it's just people don't even realize what they're saying because it's just part of sort of acceptable norm that you, you know, and so I think pointing it out that these are people have a right to their privacy and they shouldn't feel that they have to explain themselves ever is a, is a great way for for people who are listening and thinking about hosting their own events at some other time that might want to, to be really aware of. Yeah. And this idea, it goes back to the, the audio clip that Jacqueline was able to share with us. Um, the idea that maybe people have been misinformed about alcohol or perhaps even lied to because in the commercials that you see on TV, in every single movie and TV show and clip, of 
a party, of a housewarming, of a dinner party, a shower, a wedding, etc., there is always alcohol served and alcohol is synonymous with having a good time, being a good host. We have learned since we were very, very little kids watching TV that this is something that you need to have at your event and at your party. And so it makes sense just to be really, really curious about these feelings of I have to, where does that come from? And does mm -hmm. that fit with your values? It might be that your values shift and change over the lifetime as you know a little bit more, as you grow a little bit more. And you might find that the narrative of alcohol being the glue of a party or an event doesn't actually track for you anymore. And you know what? And and the, and and sort of to follow on that, there are lots of reasons why people absolutely are going to want to have their dinner party and have wine available. The point is it may not necessarily be be available or accepted mm -hmm. by all and that's that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um and so Jacqueline, I'm going to ask you, you know, we're seeing more and more um uh, alternatives, what I would say, uh, sober beverages. And, and this is not just, I mean, there's a lot of things on the market that are geared specifically to that, but also even whether it's national, like, like the big beer companies, um, we were seeing like alcohol-free wine. I mean, I think there was a day when that probably was less than tasty, but I, I think things have changed dramatically. So there's lots of options as well. Do you want to talk about maybe some of the advantages of, of folks who are looking to, whether it's reduce or eliminate, doesn't matter. Um, what are some of the advantages of maybe choosing a sober beverage? So some of the advantages, absolutely. They're you actually get to be in the moment. Sometimes when you are using alcohol, I know for myself, um, becoming impaired, you don't remember the moment as much. And uh, so, I mean, having those drinks, even just reducing a little bit helps you stay in the moment. Um, doesn't make you go home early. Um, you actually feel good in the moment, those kinds of things. You wake up the next day, and you're like, wow, I feel clear headed and I feel like going for a run today. Whereas if you've had a few, um, depending on on your tolerance and things like that, then you might not feel that way the next morning. Um, so there's loads of benefits to to reducing and and using those different, um, especially mocktails. Mocktails can be really fun. I've really gotten into those on Pinterest and, and trying them at different restaurants. And I think I just recently had a, a Moscow mule that was um, completely non-alcoholic and it tasted, I, I wouldn't have been able to taste the difference, to be honest. So mm -hmm. it's still very easy to enjoy the social aspect of being out and having an interesting drink and it doesn't have to include the alcohol. So whether it's a cold beer on a hot day on a, mm -hmm patio with some friends or whether it's a glass of wine at a dinner party or a, a bridal shower or it doesn't matter a book club actually <laughs> um even some of the alcohol free versions they again can still be red or they can still be bubbly and they can still go in the wine glass or a, whatever that might be and people can enjoy it absolutely i've had lots of sparkling um what is it cider that is non-alcoholic that has just been absolutely great so i mean there's lots of options out there for sure and uh, loads of benefits to come with that and you mentioned mocktails and i think this is really um an important one because there was a time uh, and I, perhaps i'm dating myself but there was a time when that was pretty rare i think in the restaurant business and it wasn't necessarily um promoted or encouraged but things have changed dramatically over the mm -hmm. last 20 30 years mocktails are a thing and they're a thing in restaurants and they have all kinds of menu items and great ideas um, and it's not frowned upon i mean uh, mm -hmm. restaurants encourage that by just promoting it as well don't they Absolutely. When I go to a restaurant and I see their menu list and it doesn't have a mocktail option I'm kind of like why not? Where you're not really with the times right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then I'm asking them to make one up for myself. <laughs> yeah. 
And they're usually actually very accommodating to that. Um, so it's even just having the the thought to um, ask for what you want. It doesn't have to be alcoholic. It can be something they make for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're usually very accommodating. Yeah, and, and, and you know what, at, at a time, you know, where people are going out, it reduces, it may help reduce your bill perhaps a little mm -hmm. bit, but on the same side or on sort of the flip side, it certainly still helps um, elevate a, a, a bill and, and the revenue from a restaurant side. So it's a little bit of a win-win all around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love going out and, and eating out and eating at restaurants. I love food. Um, so, I mean, having those aspects, it doesn't have to include alcohol. You're still going out and being social and, mm -hmm. and enjoying yeah. what you, you like. And not to mention, if you're the one having mocktails at the table, boom, you're the DD. You can know almost without a doubt that you are going to be safe getting home and that everyone's going to be snuggled into bed just fine that evening. And of course, that really matters. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that's uh, something that we have seen so much attention to, rightfully so, um, mm -hmm. over probably 30, 40 years um, that that we, we know has, has really been reduced. We also know, unfortunately, COVID, um, we, we saw a little bit of an increase in um, alcohol uh, and, and people getting behind the wheel when they shouldn't. And certainly we know that that's, that's not what we ever want to see. And so we, we, we want to be very clear on that. Um, but I will mention that, and it's not really as part of this conversation per se, because we are not talking about really problematic drinking and, and some of the incredible social challenges that go along with that. But, but during COVID um, here in Oxford County, the, um, you know, we, we've had a lot of talk and we've done a number of these conversations about harm reduction and, and mental health and addictions and stress management, all of those kinds of topics. But alcohol was actually the number one um, substance where problematic substance where people were presenting at our local hospitals here in Oxford County um, during COVID. It was not, um, it was not maybe what people thought it was alcohol. And I can extend that um, pre COVID, it was still alcohol as the number one problem substance when people present at treatment. Um, and I think it's been that way for the past 10 years. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, through this conversation and some of the tips and tricks that you have both been sharing that are so fantastic, uh, again, for people who just want to be mindful, want to make some changes, maybe you don't want to make some changes now, but might down the road, doesn't matter. It's just about sharing information. Um, but we've talked about really social settings, like, you know, whether it's a party or a barbecue or event or going out to a restaurant, et cetera. Um, why don't we flip a little bit and think about just, you know, personal use at home, um, and, and so very much like what I said, you know, when I, when we started and I said, I got my car last night and thought, oh, I just can't wait to get home and put my feet up and have a glass of wine in my hand and just relax. So, it, so, you know, I would say that absolutely there's something about that, that moment of, of having that wine glass and, and sometimes, you know, um, flavored water will in a wine glass for me will also do, do the trick. Cause it, it's that. It's just that whole piece that comes together where you go, ah. So um, but, can, I, yeah, can I give you a little about... bit of language sure. for this, Kelly? This moment when you come home, you have the glass of wine and you go, ha, ah, and you know that it's going to happen. So this is called a conditioned response where okay. essentially two things get wired together in our brain and we wire together. These two things are connected of alcohol and relaxation and so i hear you saying that like maybe we can trick a conditioned response maybe if i am still sitting maybe if i still have the wine glass and i have something good in there we can trick that condition response and the answer to that question is absolutely um 
this is what we call approximation. That if you have this routine or this ritual that works really well for you, that helps you to wind down, that helps you to feel relaxed, but you're thinking you might like to shift your alcohol intake just a little bit, we can still approximate or get close to what your experience was so that you can still that get that condition response of the ha. So yes, having non-alcoholic wine in your glass, still putting your feet up, still drinking it out of the fancy glass, still setting down at the same time of night and dimming the lights are all really, really good ideas. And you could even consider adding some new things into your routine to help you relax so that that whining chair at the end of the night isn't the only space where you feel like you can get some rest and relaxation. So you might consider trying your glass of wine maybe in the bathtub and gradually you can fade out that glass of wine and the bathtub becomes the relaxing piece or the book that you're going to be reading or the foot massage that your partner is going to give you. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what, Melanie, you're so bang on because in the winter in particular, uh, very similar, like that same kind of uh, relaxation feeling comes from a great cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Right at the end of the day, that feeling like, okay, I've, I, I, I've given all I've got for my day and now I'm just going to take a few moments for me and enjoy something. Um, and so I think that's a really brilliant um, way to, to show the connection and that it's maybe not the actual glass of wine that is the, the, the ticket. It is just taking some of that, some time to, to, yeah. to have for yourself. Mm -hmm. And for a lot, there's lots of people I'm sure out there and listening and, and depending on your, your age and your stage and your, where you are in life and what's happening in your world, um, sometimes five minutes is four and a half minutes more than people have. <laughs> uh -huh. right? right. And so just, just having that little something for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even trying it, see if you notice a difference, um, come from a place of curiosity. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you try something new, you might even consider going a little bit over the top in order to really, really commit to what you're trying to do. So if you are trying to shift to maybe a nice bath rather than your glass of wine, do the bath well. Consider putting a couple drops of essential oil in there or some people like bath products that fizz up. Some people like to light a candle, dim the lights, put a sign on the door that says do not knock unless somebody is dying, <laughs> right? For the folks with kids out there and really make it worthwhile for yourself to change that habit. Because if we're trying to change a habit or to live healthier lives just by taking good things away, that's hard. People don't want less good things in their life. And if your glass of wine at the end of the day feels like a really, really good thing, it doesn't make sense to take that feel good moment away from you. It makes a lot of sense to engineer that feel good moment in a slightly different way so your body can be safe and healthy, but you don't want to take away what helps keep you well and grounded and happy. That's so, that's so, so smart. And, and I'm going to go to Jacqueline because I can't remember exactly which slide, but during your presentation, when we think about, again, that that sense of relaxation, relaxation or the stress management, or just that moment to yourself when you don't have to be to be on to be doing all those things um there's that false sense of connection too because a, 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 an alcoholic drink before you go to bed actually does not make you sleep better does it no it does not you're absolutely right. so um oftentimes people will think oh a nightcap and it actually, um, you, wow, so an al alcohol is a depressant, right? And it also acts as a way to fall asleep, fall asleep easier. But in the end, your actual sleep cycle is disturbed. 
So you're going to find that even if you don't remember it, you're going to wake up more during the night and things like that. So your actual quality of sleep is reduced. So while you might think that it might help get you to sleep, maybe in the moment it does, but your quality of sleep that night will not be worth it really. Um, it would be worthwhile to look at different ways to fall asleep um, and, and just looking at bedtime routine, sleep hygiene, that kind of thing. Um, looking at um, tried and true techniques, not having TV in your room, not having those devices on before bed, blue screen time can really affect sleep. So if you're looking at for ways to fall asleep and things like that, I would stay away from alcohol. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it really, you know, it speaks to, again, the point of this particular session, that overall health and well-being piece and, and just the awareness is you know, maybe, maybe that's something that people want to think about or um, focus on. Like it's, it, it doesn't have to be all or nothing and it doesn't have to be all in. There could be little pieces, but I, I, those, those might be really doable or now that people know if they didn't know before, um, that might be something they want to focus on. And then some of Melanie's tips to just help that help change your habits because uh, we're creatures of habits. And yeah, just being aware of why you drink. So what are those main reasons that you'll get a glass of wine, get a beer? Is it social? Is it the falling asleep? Are you looking at ways to cope with stress? All of those different things are going to give you tips on how you can reduce. And it's going it, to, it's just a point of reflection on what are the reasons I drink? And knowing those different reasons will really help with figuring out whether you want to stop drinking, whether you want to reduce drinking, and also looking at those values, um, the value of health and, and different things in your life, um, and looking at how all of them interact. So it's really, it's just a point of reflection um, and seeing how alcohol it plays a role in your life. And then you're going to know if you want to reduce, which ones you can reduce by. It doesn't have to be all of them. It might just be the ones that you're not so attached to. Absolutely. Because this is a judgment free zone right here. <laughs> Absolutely. If you reduce by even just a little bit, that's still going to benefit your health. So mm -hmm. it's not an all or nothing kind of thing. It's, it's very much a um, reduced by anything and you're, you're doing great. <laughs> Absolutely. That I think that really is an important message for to, to get across because mm -hmm. um, people have different tolerance, risk tolerance levels. Yeah. Um, and in I mean, lots of different reasons why people will make their own decisions on this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, my, and that's a great point about risk tolerance, and that's a whole thing in itself, right? My risk tolerance compared to someone else's for different reasons is going to be very different. So my reasons for, for not drinking might be very different than, than yours. Um, so just rec I mm -hmm. recognize that in people. Um, some people are going to say, this is really important in my life and I don't really want to give it up. And that's okay because you know, the value it has in, in your life. Whereas, um, I value something different. And so drinking doesn't really play a huge role in my life. Then I'm going to be able to reduce a lot easier. Right. So. And it might make sense for folks to acknowledge that we are tolerant of different levels of risk based on where we're at in life. And so when you're going through a life transition, if something happens or something changes, maybe those transition moments and change moments are great moments to take stock of, is where I'm at currently working for me? Do I need to shift and make any changes? Uh, do I have a little bit more space to take on more risk or less risk? Because events such as maybe for some individuals, having a kid or starting a new job, uh, going back to school. These can all be scenarios, caring for an ailing relative, um, a diagnosis of another health piece inside your body. Those might be life changes where it's just an opportune time to take a moment, check in, make sure what you're doing is still working for you. And if it's not, think about, okay, do I want to do this any differently? And if so, here's a good time to do it. And I might hop on to that a little bit too. When you had mentioned um, life transitions and even maybe other health conditions that kind of come up in your life, 
I think it's really important that we start to normalize the conversation around alcohol, normalize the conversation um, around how much we're drinking, especially with your healthcare provider. Um, talking to your healthcare provider about your personal risk is a huge it's important because everybody's risk is different. Someone who has a risk for breast cancer or who has a risk for colon cancer already has an increased risk. And so adding alcohol on top of that is going to be different for that person than others. Um, having a family history of dementia, of, of alcohol use disorder, all of those different things. Um, so I think it's really important to start um, talking to your family physician or, or nurse practitioner about your personal health history and how alcohol impacts that. And that goes for medications. It goes for a whole bunch of different things. Absolutely. And I, I think um, actually that kind of is a, a lovely way to come full circle here because um, with the, the new information, the new guidelines that have come out, um, along with new information that's been put forward through the World Health Organization, um, I, I think we're going to see a real change, not just in, in society and, and all, of, you know, all of our behaviors, for instance, but also in the medical system and our, our, our uh, family physicians and nurse practitioners um, are going to start having different conversations with us. So this may not be something that's ever been part, for example, there's never been a discussion about this as part of your annual physical when um, when you go to your doctor's office. But with the changes that have come out and the, the, the recommendations, this is now going to be more normalized. And, you know, when they talk about when you're going in and they're checking your, your, your um, blood pressure and everything else that they do as part of that, um, they'll probably start to have some conversations to find out where are you and, and, and uh, then they can talk about what your, your personal risk given your history and your family history might be. Um, and that again is just knowledge is king, right? We, we people want to have good information and knowledge and then they make their own decisions. And I think um, a part of that is definitely knowing how much you drink. So really being able to track that and being able to give an honest answer because you actually know how much you're drinking will help that healthcare provider give you better guidance. Um, so it's not about judgment. It's not about um, anything like that. It's more about that healthcare provider wants to help you the best way they can um, and provide you the information you need to make informed choices about your health. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Now for both of you, I said my very last question was going to be if there's one thing, one takeaway you want people that are watching or listening um, to take from this session, from this Community United conversation, what would be that one takeaway from the conversation? You want to go first? Yeah. Oh, you want me to go first? Oh, yeah, sorry. I thought you said you <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll do it. Um, I would say if you take one thing away from this conversation today, um, it's be a cheerleader. Even if you're not looking to make changes in your own life, in your own drinking, that's totally perfectly fine. And there's lots of folks out there in the world who might be in a different place in space than you and whose bodies, mental health, families, financial situations could really benefit from them making some changes to the way that they drink. So if this information doesn't directly apply to you, if you maybe don't drink at all, or you don't want to make changes, that's totally fine. And please, please, please be a cheerleader to the folks in your life who might be trying to make some changes. If you hear about somebody doing dry January, February, cheer them on. If somebody does order a mocktail at the restaurant, you might say, wow, that actually sounds really good great order um consider having some mocktails at your party and water available at your party and you can support your friends even when you don't want to make any change or you don't need to make any change and that's so 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 good it's a it's a thing that a really wonderful friend would do for their friends so if you take anything away today be a cheerleader exactly um so mine's going to be very short um, to be mindful of how often and how much you drink and to consider drinking less, whatever that might look like for you. 
Um, and no matter how much you're drinking, less is, is going to benefit your health. Um, just because the, the health information around alcohol has changed drastically over the last 10 years. And uh, that's about it. Well, I, I think that's a great way to end our session. Um, you know, these we really do this work here at United Way Oxford. We want to share information. We want to highlight, raise awareness on, again, on issues that we call unignorable issues. We want to build empathy and understanding and reduce stigma on, on a host of different topics and issues. And this was a great opportunity to share something that I think for most people is really quite new. And so while from a public health perspective, this information might not be particularly new, I think for the average person, it, there's been a real shift now and a dramatic shift in what they're saying are our safe levels. Um, and so again, we're sharing because sharing is caring and it, that is mm -hmm. what we do. And so we're very grateful for the people that have joined us this evening. And we're certainly grateful for those that will take time over um, the coming days, weeks, months to participate, to watch. You know, I mentioned at the beginning, these are really wonderful opportunities for lunch and learns or, you know, your book club to discuss it or to sit around you know, a family gathering and, and have a discussion afterwards and learn something as a group. So no matter how you may benefit or how you may be using these um, recordings, we are grateful that we could be a part of, of maybe your journey. I would like to once again, um, thank Southwest Public Health for sponsoring this and really bringing it to our attention that it is something that required attention and that there was an opportunity when we think about community health and well-being this is a piece of that conversation and so i am very grateful that um, we were able to have their support uh, this evening to make that happen um, i remind people always that if you are looking for information, um, regardless of what the topic might be, if you are looking for information and you don't know where to go, please call 211. Um, the, there is a website as well, and you can certainly use that as a reference, but um, the 24 hour seven phone service, it's an information referral service. It is a wonderful way to get directed specifically to whatever support might be available and might be there to help you. So um, a little shout out to uh, 211 and why that really matters in our community. I would like to thank you both. You've been fantastic. Um, I, I really appreciate you sharing and sharing from a personal level as well, uh, because this is really, this is us on a very human level and very real um, to try and connect to people all across our community. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We are very grateful. And I hope that you walk away with something that is inspiring, with something that maybe can give you pause and a moment to think. And uh, if, if this helps, um, we're really glad to be able to provide it to you. If you're looking for the recording afterwards, you can visit the United Way Oxford website, uh, which is unitedwayoxford.ca. Uh, please feel free to go there. You can certainly see the video. You can learn lots of other things that United Way is doing here in our community. Um, as the largest non-government funder of social and human services, we have lots on the go and we're really active and involved with many things. So it's a great way to, to again, learn and know more about what's happening um, and if you want to sign up for our newsletter, we'd love to be able to always share more information um, about ourselves and our partners and some of the amazing work that's happening here in Oxford County to help um, our local residents, our, our neighbors, our family, our friends, our co-workers, etc. So thank you everyone for joining us here this <coughs> evening. We appreciate your time and we wish you all the best. And um, with my almost empty coffee cup, I will say cheers. <laughs> so thank you. Good night.